welcome to a very special edition of India at 75 for the New Indian Express. We're celebrating 75 years of India's independence. We're looking back, looking forward. We have two uh, gentlemen who uh, really understand the armed forces, the nature of warfare, how it's changed. Uh, Air Vice Marshal Arjun Subramaniam uh, and Lieutenant General H.S. Panag. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us. And um, we really would like to get into it right away. Uh, let's talk about the nature of warfare itself and how it's changed. And if I may, I'd like to begin with General Panag. Uh, you know, for instance, the Operation Kabaddi that you led. Now, that wasn't a regular war, but, you know, it was, it was uh, uh, you know, a limited uh, effort or limited uh, uh, warfare. So has the nature of war in, in the 21st century really uh, changed and what are the new rules of engagement we're looking at? The last uh, major decisive war was probably the Gulf War One and Two, hmm. where uh, particularly Gulf War One, where large scale forces were used. Hmm. Now, since then, large scale forces have not been used, uh, and the wars have not been decisive as they used to be by total annihilation of the enemy or making it uh, capitulate. Right. And the use of force today is uh, is for very specific purposes, for very short, short um, uh, durations. And it is based on very high end military technology. Hmm. And this is the trend that uh, that that we have uh, we are we are witnessing all over the world. Uh, so that is why when people talk of an all out war with China or an yeah. all out war with Pakistan, right. it's it's highly unlikely that an all-out war would take place, particularly between nuclear powers. Yeah. Like in the subcontinent and with China, we are all nuclear powers. At some stage, nuclear weapons will come into play. Of course, people have been arguing that below the nuclear threshold, there is a, there is a window and all. It is there, but the risk is so much. And that is why the application of force in future will be short duration for a specific aim and with high-end military technology. Hey, Marshal Arjun Subramanian, may I bring you in here? Uh, since you're a war historian, you've written extensively on India's wars uh, in the past. What are the lessons that we could learn from them uh, going forward? Uh, you know, uh, thanks for having me on the show, Kaveri. Uh, but before that, I'd like to sort of endorse every one of the points that General Panag yeah. brought in. Brought in. Uh, and there is only one addition that I'd like to make to his narrative, and that is... Uh, Never before have political outcomes been so important in, in, in the employment of force as an instrument of statecraft. Right. You know, in the absence of the possibility of any decisive victories or defeats, ultimately it is political outcomes that is going to control or that is going to dictate how nations use force as an instrument of statecraft. That is why, unlike earlier, wherein you know, uh, militaries uh, with, 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 with large asymmetries could employ force with a kind of a cowboyish or even a gung ho attitude. Right. Today, that kind of approaches, those kind of approaches are just not possible. Hmm. So, therefore, uh, greater calibration, greater use of technology, uh, looking at outcomes right from the word go, even by generals, air marshals, and admirals. You know, you know in the past, uh, what, ha what happened is that militaries did their bit. And then diplomacy kicked in and the political outcomes were thereafter crafted. Right. We have no such flexibility in today's conflict milieu. Right. It has to be full spectrum operations and a whole of government approach that looks at the employment of force with, with, with great calibration right. and care. Right. Now, uh, you, you asked about what are the lessons that we can draw? Hmm. Uh, no, I think uh, that, that's a huge landscape. Yeah. So, so let me bring out a couple of uh, a couple of quick lessons. Yes. Uh, the first is uh, that I think the Indian application of force since independence has been responsible and restrained, mm. but at the same time that has left us vulnerable to surprise and preemption. Mm. And uh, I think in recent years, uh, while we continue to espouse. Uh, the principle of responsibility and restraint. But I think there is also an emerging uh, 
narrative or dialogue that is increasingly taking place of saying that, look, uh, if India is to be a rising power of consequence, I think it needs to relook at several concepts of deterrence, coercion, and compellence, and see whether we can migrate from a policy of ex excessive restraint and diffidence mm. to a certain proactive approach to the application of force. And when you talked about Operation Kabaddi that, that General Panag was actively involved in, uh, that was a reflection that this uh, this approach within yeah. India's military has existed for quite some time. Right. There have not been just with not just suddenly overnight with Uri no. and you know as everybody thought. <laughs> Absolutely not. Uh, I, I'm to say, uh, gen, uh, uh, commanders such as General Panag, General Nanavati, and the others have been thinking over years yeah. as to how best we can seize the initiative and how best one can look at proactive approaches uh, to the employment of force. Right. Uh, General Panag, of course, I'd like to bring you in here and talk a bit about this idea that how important is it for uh, uh, any nation to have such uh, 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 sort of uh, aggression ingrained in, their uh, in the DNA of their armed forces? I think by nature, armed forces well understand that uh, the one who uh, has seizes the initiative, hmm. you know, and retains it, it is, uh, it has got a head start. Right. Okay. The other side has to then uh, has to then uh, react. In fact, if somebody, uh, I often used to say that the most important leadership quality a leader must have is initiative. Hmm. Is to initiate action right. and initiate action first. Right. So make the other side react. Right. Uh, so uh, while Arjun mentioned that we were earlier late in the sense that in forty seven forty eight the Chinese you know, uh, started, the, uh, sorry, the Pakistani the Pakistan. raiders came first, yes. then we respond. Right. In, um, uh, in 65, again, it was a response situation from what they were doing, Kashmir or Anav Kach, it was a response situation. Mm -hmm. uh, 62 also, to a great extent, we responded to what the Chinese were, uh, were doing rather right. than initiating. But Bangladesh definitely remains an exception. Absolutely. Uh, in the sense that... Uh, we uh, right from the word go we were we had taken um, you know appropriate action both for a people's war then shaping the battlefield and finally the lightning uh, campaign of uh, uh, 13 days ipkf again was uh, uh, was 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 initiative taken by us uh, it was not we were not reacting to a situation it was an understanding yeah uh, kargil we reacted I mean, we were caught by surprise. Absolutely. And uh, in, in Eastern Ladakh, the reaction, yeah. we, were, we were caught. I mean, in the sense that uh, we, we have been talking about this situation that a preemption can take place along the LAC or along the LOC for that matter. And we should always be prepared with reserves and we should preempt the preemp preemptor right. or, or be there. Uh, but again, in eastern Ladakh, uh, uh, sad to say that the, in the areas which were uh, which which were along the LAC and where no troops were physically deployed because main defenses are a little far behind because that is, those areas are suitable for defense, uh, the Chinese just walked in. Yeah. At, uh, in, in 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 the area of they came up to crossroads in Depsang Plains, they 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 came down into the Kugrang River. And uh, even from um, finger uh, eight to finger uh, four, uh, you know, back in 1988, when I was, uh, I took the first uh, contingent of mechanized infantry, uh, mechanized forces of one in mechanized battalion and two squadrons to Ladakh uh, in 1988. That was a follow up of, 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 of uh, the Sundarong Shu incident. And uh, General Sundarji was very keen that we put mechanized forces there. And uh, Sirijap used to be my preemptive task. Oh. That means before the, at that time, the Chinese were far away. They were right. not forward and they, they, were, they were not so aggressive on the LHC. But uh, it was Sirijap was my preemptive task. And since there was no road, uh, running, you know, from Pobrang and along this, what even, even up to Finger Four, and you couldn't cross Finger Four anyway. So, uh, since the BMPs are amphibious, 
So we used we uh, our, we wanted to do this action at night, swimming across the Pingong oh. on the BMPs to capture a Siri Jap. Yeah. So if this was thought of by us In- almost thirty three years ago, yeah. I find no reason as to why we should have been been surprised. So this whole thing about uh, being surprised at even strategic level or tactical level and then not being able to able able to once you come to know able to act before the enemy act i think this is something that we must learn right. and there's no point no point responding once you respond you know then uh, uh, the, the game changes uh, and Masha, this is such an interesting point, you know, even internally we saw in 2611 how we were so late to respond with uh, the NSG. Are, are these not lessons that we will ever learn? No, uh, you, you know, the thing is, uh, uh, the thing is, uh, I, I've always, uh, uh, I have a thought mulling in my mind, which I call, which I call the elephant awakens. And, <laughs> and you know, we we do have, we do have periodic uh, eras wherein uh, there are several commanders, as I mentioned, there is there are also at times accompanying political establishments that want to be more proactive in our approach. Okay, uh, for, uh, for example, uh, uh, let, let me take you back one year before uh, General Panag, uh, you know, you know, moved his mechanized forces was, was in charge of mechanized forces in in Eastern Ladakh. Uh, I, I, I think. Uh, we lost out on a wonderful opportunity after the Sundorang Chu crisis. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, let, let, let me not, uh, uh, you know, I wouldn't like to be despondent or negative about these issues because I also want to highlight that at several times in, in India's recent military history, there have been com- combinations of the political executive and the military who've taken decisions that are truly proactive and that have even to the point of being spectacular. Hmm. For example, if you look at the occupation of the Salto Road Ridge in 1984, hmm. it was a spectacular operation by the Indian Army supported by the Indian Air Force hmm. to seize a set of strategic heights right. that have been very difficult to hold on to for the last 30 years plus, And they have been a drain on the exchequer. But then when you look at India-Pakistan, when you look at the India-Pakistan-China conundrum, right. uh, the ego and prestige is extremely important, important. Is, is extremely important as, as a strategic tool. Right. Now, if you if you look at 1967, the Nathula firefight that took place. Yeah. Uh, I mean to say, had it not been for General Sagat Singh, who was commanding 17 Division, I don't think the Indians would have given that kind of a response that fa- finally ensued. Right. Nobody in India in 1967 could imagine that an artillery duel with the Chinese could leave hundreds dead on either side. And uh, uh, the casualty figures on the Chinese side uh, were significantly higher than what, uh, the, than what we suffered. Sundarung Chu, nobody, the Chinese did not anticipate the kind of muscular response uh, uh, that emerged following the occupation of a, you know, you know, a small hamlet within uh, the Wangdong uh, uh, within the Wangdong Bowl. But then General Sundarji, uh, General Narhari and General J.M. Singh put together an extremely proactive response to the extent that in 1987, General Sundarji was, 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 was asked by Delhi that, look, I think now you need to rein in your generals. Right. Because both General Narhari and General J.M. Singh were building up capability for a possible limited offensive across the line of actual uh, control, which was unheard of in the 1980s. Right. So, so it's not that it's not that we have a complete strategic DNA of diffidence and restraint. Hmm. The Indian military ethos is not one of is not one of only strategic uh, restraint and diffidence. Hmm. It is just that uh, it is just that putting everything together as a whole of government package that demonstrates a proactive and, a, and an assertive approach is something which is still in the making. And I think, uh, you know, to, to, to be fair, uh, to be very fair to the current, uh, uh, you know, strategic dispensation, there have been several overt attempts to raise the proactive profile uh, of India on, you know, along the line of actual control and line of control. It is just that probably there is a still 
a significant gap between intent and capability. So how do we raise that capability, Janet Banag? What do we do there? Because the cost of war is enormous and no one understands it better than people like you who've actually fought wars. You know, it's all very well. And I love the way General Panak consistently shuts down people on Twitter who uh, talk to him about uh, patriotism and nationalism. And kudos to you, General, for doing that. But uh, the cost of war is so enormous. And uh, our internal wars, forget uh, our, uh, uh, you know, wars across the border, internal wars. And you know that better better than most people. You've seen men die, you've seen families suffer. So what does one do where, uh, you know, the cost of war is uh, not as great as it is, and yet we have uh, an aggressive intent, and we uh, are able to show the world that, you know, we are, uh, and it's important, as you said, right, uh, Marshall, that we do need to show the world that we are, and assertive power, if not an aggressive power where the military uh, is concerned. So General Padar, what do we do? Let me first link this question, uh, the question that you have asked to what Arjun just, yeah. just now said about uh, the Sundarang Chu. See, a very interesting point about Sundarang Chu is that at the time of Sundarang Chu incident, the Chinese GDP was only marginally higher That's than right. us. Yeah. Only marginally higher. Yeah. A big factor. The Chinese military was not uh, as potent and as strong and as technologically advanced as exactly. it is today. In fact, let me say that at times we had edge over them hmm. because in that time they did not even have the kind of transport aircraft that could transport their mechanized forces forward and they would have had to move long distances by road Whereas we had that capability in terms of IL-76, uh, you know, uh, uh, aircraft uh, and all that. And uh, so the Chinese swallowed it. All our aggressive actions and our forward movement, both in Ladakh and there. And incidentally, it was the first time we were actually going for a forward posture. Hmm. So that forward posture does not mean sitting on the LSE hmm. after 1962. Right. We had uh, our defenses otherwise were way behind. Right. So, uh, so this is a this is a big factor that yeah. today China's GDP is five times ours. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, if if even if we if even if uh, let's say if our GDP goes up to even five trillion, right? You know, our budget will double. Yeah. And from forty six trillion uh, billion dollars. We'll go up to uh, uh, you know a hundred billion dollars. That's right. That 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 is quite. That is what the army feels it it will it will require. And uh, while we make much of pension bills and all those things are fine, that is because this is the budget. But if our GDP goes up, our economy goes up, yeah. automatically the defense budget will go up. That's Having right. said that, let me come back to this issue that you know, the war has enormous cost today. Yeah. Today, uh, I mean. Uh, the number of people uh, uh, who die in uh, in battle, uh, it is not only it, it. The numbers are not that high in terms of what what has happened in the past. America left fifty eight thousand dead in Vietnam yeah. alone. Fifty eight thousand dead in Vietnam. Amazing. So, but but today because of media visibility, today because yeah. of connectivity, uh, every man a soldier who dies, in particular a soldier, because a soldier dies. For the nation, yeah. So he's not. It's not an accident. It's not. It's not something. It's not not because of disease. He dies for the nation. So it's an emotional factor, and it's so number of casualties is very in terms of uh, is is very is a very major factor. Right. Then the other thing is the size. We are a, you know, we have been arguing over the in the past that we are a manpower intensive army because we have to man it in mountains this and that. That is because this because you want to approach it this way, mm. uh, that you want to hold uh, the ground so that the enemy doesn't come. You know, like in case of Pakistan, we are deployed all along the island. But there are different ways of doing it. That's right. Right. You can if you have a much more uh, technologically advanced force. Yeah. You have the surveillance means. You have a potent air element, a potent naval element who can exert pressure elsewhere. So 
you know the size of the of the the man on the ground can can reduce that's right and uh, so that is that that i think is a one factor then also our structures and organizations uh, i often say that india uh, is fighting the fourth generation war hmm. you know in our insurgencies for the last 30 40 years we have been training and upgrading ourselves to fight the third generation war of maneuver right that is you know a kind of conventional conflict that's right and we are a mindset at times is of the second, second generation, generation going back to the first world war right so a huge gigantic organization uh, is slow to respond and much more money is spent on its maintenance than if you have a much smaller and a more potent force look that's at the chinese Yeah. the chinese had used to at one time you know have a four uh, a million people under arms uh, even higher than uh, the united states at its peak and uh, they have started reducing their they have reduced the size of their formations you know the group armies have been become armies and uh, the divisions have been turned into combined armed brigades today a core of their or the army of theirs has got six combined armed brigades whereas a core of ours would probably have you know three divisions right uh, but they are technologically very advanced right. in eastern ladakh the chinese by as per my assessment have used uh, up to three uh, to four combined armed brigades only in the front line obviously if you are using three to four combined armed brigades up front then you have to back them up with another 3 to 4 combined armed brigades right uh, so about eight uh, odd com- combined armed brigades and we at the peak had pumped in four divisions wow uh, almost uh, uh, um, i mean you can say 12 uh, uh, brigades uh, and much larger in much larger in, in in size of course they had a terrain advantage and they could be in certain positions but we had to respond like that and plus we had to cater for a counter offensive should we have to uh, go in for but what i'm trying to say is that even the chinese who were known for their mass have and reduced in size right. made their armed forces more potent and we are not attacking this problem you know in a in a in a i would say in a determined manner right and we are talking about it but we do not attack this problem in a determined manner right but today if i were to distribute the defense budget i would put it navy air force prior to that that's right. technology right. Uh, what a what a navy, what navy can do in the seas yeah. to yeah. advance our national interest is is far beyond uh, what anybody else can do i mean what the, uh, the ground forces can do air power right i would have liked to see that today we had 130 126 rifles you know And that kind of we would have had a quantum jump over 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 our uh, our instead adversity. of this thirty six well, that yeah. we finally. Well, went. I'm not saying that thirty six are also good, but this is what we require. But with the with the budget being spread out in a over an entire elephantine mass, uh, there's very little left for anything else. Right. So we have to attack this problem. We have to reduce our uh, size, optimize it. Uh, we are emotionally attached to it, you know. Now, yeah. if the statistically if you work out the number of casualties the number of attacks and how many people die we are we are over insuring hmm. the whole world functions on three companies to a battalion we function on four on the pretext of we'll have to put in more we have to do this we have to do that it's illogical right. so i leave it at that to say that we need to put in a determined effort to cut down our size improve our technology and invest and put our money where it matters right absolutely and, and no one knows that better than a marshal uh, arjun subramanyam i think uh, you know you have been in the air force so you understand why it needs much more support i think the whole idea of in- integrated warfare and an integrated uh, um, uh, uh, leadership that we've been talking about for the longest time uh, when will this actually start happening okay so you know uh, uh, let me touch on uh, you know let me take the conversation forward from where general panag left it yes and to my mind uh, i think we've taken a long time to shed many 
you know, a predominantly colonial mindset when it comes to the prosecution of war. Now, our, you know, you know, even amongst the allies, even amongst the Japanese, the, uh, you know, you know, you know, sorry, even amongst the Americans uh, and the, the, the Germans and the Japanese and the British, of, of all the four, the British were the least known to execute maneuver. Hmm. Now, I think this, a, a similar mindset did steep into the Indian military after independence. And therefore, this, the word that I would like to use, uh, that is the need of the hour, is greater flexibility and maneuver in the military mind. Right. Not, not entirely on the ground, not only on the ground or in the air or in the maritime domain, but also in the mind. Hmm. Because what we are seeing increasingly with China uh, is uh, uh, China is pushing as hard as possible to win without fighting. Right. Which means to say it is employing its, its, its vast resources and asymmetry uh, to, uh, uh, you, you know, uh, to prosecute what I call all measures short of war. Right. Many people call it the gray zone. People call it hybrid warfare, whatever, you, whatever name you give it. But all this involves a lot of improved maneuver in the mind. I, I think, uh, you know, based on several discussions that we have at the National Defense College, and, and I think this is rapidly seeping into the Indian military mind, and it is rapidly seeping even into the strategic establishment. So, so strategic, so, so maneuver of the mind, the need for better technology, the need for downsizing and for balancing uh, the Navy, the uh, uh, Air Force and the Army, uh, you know, in theory, everyone understands it. Right. It is putting it into practice that, that, that offers the greatest, you know, that, that offer the greatest stumbling blocks. Yeah. And that's what integration is all about. That's right. Now, if you look at it in terms of maneuver, uh, maritime spaces and air spaces offer the maximum potential. Yeah. Offer the maximum potential. Right. Continental boundaries and frontiers and, 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 and land is, is ideal for friction. Yes. So we have to move away from friction to maneuver. And, and that's, where, uh, 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 that's where a little more understanding of the maritime and aerial domains uh, uh, must prevail within, uh, within the war fighting community, not only the strategic establishment, but also the war fighting community. For example, let me give, uh, uh, let me give you another analogy. Suppose the asymmetry between India and China is a given. Hmm. Suppose we accept that leapfrogging is not going to reduce the asymmetry. And suppose we, suppose we say that, look, given all this, what is it that is likely to influence the behavior of our adversary, in, in this case, if it is China? And to my mind, as, uh, to my mind as, a, uh, as an aerial warfighter, I would say, that the one single aspect that is likely to influence the behavior of the adversary once we get into limited conflict or a skirmish or an engagement is firepower. How do you, how do you cause the maximum amount of combat attrition to a more powerful adversary in the shortest possible time so that you can get to the negotiating table at the earliest? That's right. To drive political outcomes. Yeah. And we saw that. We've seen that. Uh, the 71 war, I think, was a classic example of that, wasn't it? Yeah. So do, do we, uh, have we not learned uh, anything from that? Uh, is, the polit is there a distinction between uh, the political will and the military uh, leadership? Does the po political leadership, uh, is it at odds with the military leadership? No, I, I don't. I don't think the political leadership is at odds with the military. It is just that I think that, that uh, we don't have a strong enough strategic bridge. Hmm. And when I say strategic bridge, a strategic bridge is actually a robust connect between policy makers, policy makers and strategy makers, and operational practitioners. Right. So, so you know, you know uh, uh, mind you, uh, the, the, the Indian politician is, is, is aware of the consequences of war and conflict. Yeah. And, and, and he's aware of the potential of the instrument of force at his or her disposal. So therefore, uh, if, I were to, if I were to very briefly uh, put my finger on where the problem is, I think the problem is in the strategic bridge. 
Right. What do we do about that, General Panak? Well, uh, uh, there, is, there, there are uh, major national security reforms required, and uh, one has to start with, uh, with, the, with the, uh, the higher direction of war as to our, our decision-making uh, process. Uh, at the moment, it remains very ambiguous. Mm -hmm. It lacks clarity. The National Security Council uh, does not function the way it should be functioning. Uh, there, uh, the, take the take an example that the NSA was given the charter of working out the national security strategy in two zero one eight. Yeah, that's it's right. It, but the, the national security strategy has not not come out. Yeah. Well, if it's classified, I do not see what reason is there for it to be classified. Hmm. Uh, of course, all, always there are two aspects to a national security strategy: the classified portion and the and the public domain portion. Right. The public domain, uh, this thing lays out for the nation, for the public to know as to how we will respond yeah. in, in crisis situations. That's what when you see we see the national security strategy of the United States or even China, when you see it on 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 the net. It, it gives you an indication as to how these nations will conduct themselves. Right. No, I find no reason as to why ours should not be in public domain. Right. So then what about strategic reviews? What about the, uh, you see, we, we, we created an army. We inherited an army. We kept on increasing it in size and 62 forced us. So for a, for a bygone era, Right. And mostly for, for a second generation transgressing into a third generation uh, war. You know, we, we produced an army for that. Thereafter, we have hung on to it with our dear lives. <laughs> uh, we have, nobody has really, uh, uh, really bothered. Can be, uh, once, you, uh, once a strategic review is carried out, a national security strategy is evolved. Okay, what kind of wars we are going to fight? How are we going to respond to crisis situations in future? Yeah. That will decide what kind of an army and, you know, Navy, Navy and the Air Force and other resources that you require. Right. And that's why uh, uh, when we talked about that, we focused on uh, Air Force and the Navy. Why? Because it will straightway tell you that in the kind of warfare of the future, air power, missile power, Cyber warfare, electronic warfare are going to be right up front with, right. with which you can punish an adversary, you know, with, without really moving masses of uh, masses of people, uh, people forward. So this in this, this and meshing the bridge that he talked about between the critical leadership and the armed forces and the and and a kind of a synergy that should be there. Right. to think about change and reform is not there. We need to reform our higher direction of war, our decision-making, and how, uh, how, how we, what we discuss, how we look at wars of the, of the future, you know, through a strategic review, national security strategy, right. and so on. This is, this, is, this is a missing link. Right. Then uh, you see, again, uh, that our ministers uh, are, uh, are, rather, our are, are politicians, our uh, political leaders are too much involved in politics. Right. They spend very little time on, uh, on, 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 the, on, the, on their actual job. Right. And this in particular applies, I'm talking of the defense minister. <laughs> uh, in the United States, the secretary of defense, he's a mover and a shaker. Yeah. He hardly gets involved in the party. <laughs> you know, the, you, you really find them, really find the president's uh, cabinet getting involved in party affairs. Hmm. That, that is left to just so many other people who are there. They right. are, and look at Rumsfeld is criticized for, uh, you know, that his over uh, sort of reaching, over uh, bearing attitude towards the military. Look at the kind of reforms he has, he brought about for the United States. Right. He brought them down from, from uh, divisions and corps down to, to brigade uh, combat teams, a more agile force. Right. And, he was deeply involved in it. That, you know the the what is what is called the uh, uh, you know the revolution in military affairs. Rumsfeld was was deeply involved into it on day to day basis. So whereas it doesn't happen in in, in our case. So there is a need to relook at how uh, our political leadership uh, looks at 
looks at their armed forces, right. how this, you know, the bid between the two has to be uh, sort of built. And it has to be, it has to be, what should I say? It has to be uh, a formal. Uh, you know, in 1962, when uh, the, uh, Prime Minister Nehru said, that throw them off the Thagla Ridge. Right. And so did men and say, and these directions were given to uh, General Thapa and to the DMO and also to General Call. Uh, so, uh, but General Thapar, I granted to him that he said, okay, let's have the order in writing. Right. So, the, Mr. Sareen was the Joint Secretary then in the MOD. He sent out a four or five liner for the Indian Army to almost go to war with China. Right. <laughs> Throw them off the Thangna Ridge. You know, right. though he, though he, and he left a very ambiguous thing. So has, does our government ever give a formal political directive? Or it is just, General Saab, kuch kar do. <laughs> kar lo. Kar but look, that is not. The government must give a political directive with political uh, aim defined. Right. Which the military must translate into its, uh, the, the, you know, the, the military um, uh, aim of the, of the, of the conflict of, 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 of use of force for that matter. So, right. This absence of directive, why do you think we do not reclassify our, our records? Yeah, I mean, look at the Henderson Brooks of all of <laughs> yeah. them. I mean, that okay. is the Henderson most Brooks, obvious. Henderson Brooks, a small thing. We don't even have an official history of 1971 war. Yeah. The history that has been published is unofficial. You know, uh, published true. by retired officials of the uh, of of the Ministry of uh, Defense of the uh, history history division of Ministry of Defense. Uh, it they are under their own name. It's not it's nothing to do with the with the Ministry of Defense. So we don't even have a formal um, uh, official uh, history of 1970 war war the greatest victory of India absolutely uh, in, in all times. I would right. say in, in probably one of the greatest in our history and one probably one of the best. In the One world. of the greatest actually in the world. I mean, which Absolutely. world has actually created so, another nation like so that? This just this just shows how we how we view these things. Yeah. I mean, what will happen if the if the minutes of the meeting, which was chaired by uh, Mrs. Gandhi, are made public today? Right. Then all these you know juvenile controversies about that Sam said this and right. Mrs. Gandhi said this. I mean, it, these would be these would get clarified. Yeah. And uh, also, why not put out the directives of the army headquarters, naval air headquarters, and what the people received, and all that? Then only will you have understand what how it happened. But having said that, the seventy one was still a job well done in terms of even at the higher level. Yeah, of course. And um, and Ashin, uh, since you are a historian, I, I would like to bring you in here because. Uh, as General Panag said, there's so much that is still uh, unknown, you know, or not known or not officially known. Uh, and we have this, uh, uh, you know, and yet we have uh, uh, this new sort of um, emotional celebration of uh, the soldier, you know, in the national, in the new uh, emerging India that you have, you know, the celebration of the martyr, the celebration of the soldier, but that's a very emotional it's not an intellectual uh, exercise uh, and I think that is very significant you know when do we um, become intellectual about it I mean when do we start becoming intelligent about it you know uh, uh, before that I just uh, wanted to sort of uh, uh, offer a bit of a contrarian perspective to what mm -hmm. General Panag mentioned now uh, he mentioned about now by no yardstick am I justifying the absence of a national security strategy or a national security doctrine. It is, it is, uh, it is a must for, uh, it is a must for a rising power and a, and a power who wants to join the global stage. That's right. But having said that, look at the United States, every year they come out with a national security review. They are the ones who coined the term, the revolution in military affairs. Mm -hmm. They are at the forefront of doctrinal advancement, but yet in the post-World War II era, They've the not won a single war. Seated on the battlefield. They've not won a single war. Yes. So, 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 so now, so now, when you discuss that within strategic circles, so Indian strategic circles have a fairly strong argument to say that look, we haven't done too badly. Uh, we don't. We don't have a national security doctrine. We don't have a national security strategy. Uh, uh, we like to keep our. We like to keep our methods 
ambiguous and it hasn't been too bad it hasn't you you know it hasn't resulted in more than one uh, real failure which is 1962 right so uh, it's a tough it's a tough debate that is currently going on right. between between those who believe in systems and processes and they are very very important and that is why i i am also of the belief that you need to have a articulated strategy and a doctrine and there is a very strong set of people who believe that we don't need to radically change what we've been doing so far because the results haven't been all that bad right why fix something that ain't that, broken you know then there are arguments that say who says india doesn't have a strategic culture it has a strategic culture which is not articulated in writing but it is there in the mind and it is there when execution takes place so you know there are both these arguments uh, and therefore i think what we what we really have is a you know you know is a, we are a typical raucous democracy and we, uh, so 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 we, we we can't help that and the second thing is you ask me is that how do we how do we move away from jingoism and yeah. look no no that will happen when the military is significantly detached from mainstream society Hmm. in india one of the uh, you, you know i think uh, and i think now you are seeing the military which is representative truly of india okay. india with all its multicultural the democratic flavor, diversity society yeah. you no longer belong to affluent families who join That's the right. so 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 that is one step in in the direction that you are talking about right the, the second set you are talking about we are talking about is that uh, uh during the early years after independence we lived in a neighborhood that was stressed that had a lot of military takeovers all around right so so a fledgling democracy with founding fathers who had an inherent dislike for the military yeah. because of what they had seen uh, their experience with the british right so there was this attempt to say that look we we need to we, we need to at least still indian democracy is robust enough we need to keep the military relatively isolated from civil society right uh, but i think that process i think we are evolving in the right i think we are evolving in the uh, in a decent direction uh, and i think uh, uh, the military now is 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 a significant part of civil society uh, but yes i think there is a need to reflect on uh, this uh, unnecessary hagiography and eulogizing Uh, the military, particularly in times of crisis. Right. Any closing thoughts, Sir uh, General Panag and uh, M. Ashik? I think uh, what I would like to uh, end by saying is that uh, our uh, military and uh, our wars—it's uh, been a mixed bag, mm. and uh, we haven't. I agree with the judge entirely. We haven't done badly at all. Uh, 1962 war, the only major, you know, catastrophic defeat that we have uh, suffered, right. and uh, uh, even there, I would say, even there, I would say that we lost the war, uh, but we got the borders. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that we were because of underdeveloped infrastructure, because of the you know the as we move forward uh, for the uh, you know during the forward policy twice up to 59 it was a traditional forward policy mark the frontier but beyond 59 particularly in 61 62 it became contest the contest the other side now that is what brought about the clash but had um, prime minister nehru not done this then chinese would have simply walked up to the area up to where we had the roads right and we didn't have the roads almost to most of the places right so even there even there i would say we were defeated but we got the borders right uh, otherwise the borders wouldn't not have been there right and now now no matter what china does barring a, you know all these pin pricks and all most minor this thing that have been going on because of uh, in eastern ladakh i don't think china can really alter the lac right territory is no territory is no longer an issue what it has proven in 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 uh, in eastern ladakh is what we had discussed earlier part of the uh, the talk was that uh, 
uh, modern, the future of war, how the war is going to take place. China did a limited action. Right. It asserted itself. Right. It got its, uh, you know, proved the point about its 59 claim line and left it at that. Right. It doesn't want to do anything more. Right. Now both sides are facing each other because both are suspicious of each other. Okay, if you leave, then we'll do it or he will leave. Yeah. Do, you know, that right. kind of a thing. Right. So I, I feel that, I mean, how can, how can anybody imagine that China can come marching into a cross with his might? Well, then, uh, the, as nuclear uh, weapon states, what have you got the nukes for? Yeah. Something that's unimaginable. So this is how it will happen. And this is how it happened. Right. I think that's what we should look at, the, the reform ourselves to fight the wars of 21st century. Which are limited, which are uh, shorter duration, which are uh, um, aided by uh, technological uh, uh, firepower. Those are the wars yes. of the future. Yes. And which are about assertion. Not necessarily just responding, which are proactive sometimes. So, uh, so you know, there are uh, you know, I, I'd like to uh, uh, offer two take two closing points. Yes. The first is that I think seventy five years is a good time to reflect on uh, the role of the military in a democracy. Yes. And I think the Indian military has done a sterling job when it comes to upholding, protecting, and furthering democracy. Absolutely. No question of that. And the second point that I wanted to uh, talk about, yes, the second point I wanted to talk about earlier on, uh, we used to egg on troops and, and, and the forces by saying, uh, together we fight and together we win. Right. Today, that dialogue has to be expanded significantly to encompass the whole of government. Yeah. It's only if there is a whole of government approach that understands uh, the, 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 the potency and the importance and the relevance of the instrument of force and statecraft. Only then can we sort of uh, imbibe this mantra of together we fight and together we win, but this togetherness is, is across the entire spectrum of government. Yeah. Not just the three armed forces. That's right. Wonderful. It was such a pleasure to talk to you both. Uh, thank you so much for making time for us. And truly, um, I've learned so much and I think our listeners will too. Thank you very much, Janet Panag. Thank you very much, Air Marshal. It was a true pleasure and an honor. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Kaveri. Thank you, Janet Panag.